Yeah, I was telling them, I said that uh, I had heard of an engineer that um, was testing out different admixtures in his concrete and he tried to duck fat, but it just resulted in quacks in his concrete. <laughs> Is that on the recording? Yeah, that one's on the recording. <laughs> That's at least it. Like, comment, subscribe. <laughs> The only, thing, the, only thing that's missing, the only thing that's missing is something like, this is brought to you by Rain Shadow Legends. <laughs> Next thing you know, I'm going to get some like copyright strike or something over that. <laughs> I'm not. Either, but let's go to the announcements slide. <laughs> oh, goodness. Go to the announcements. Oh, goodness. All right. Lecture 10. Um, I love this job. Uh, so, uh, attend, uh, attendance grade should be up to date. Uh, we should be rocking and rolling. 3.2 uh, is graded. The solution's posted. 3.3 um, uh, is. Uh, uh, due today. So homework 3.4 is going to be due Friday. I'm going to assign homework 4 that's not due Monday. It's due the following Wednesday. And then Friday we celebrate. Um, so uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else worth mentioning. Oh, um, one thing that might be worth mentioning, uh, just so you all are aware, before class on Friday, it's going to be a little crowded in the atrium. So just so you are aware. Um, they are lining up the procession for the event over there in the atrium. So just so make your way directly through. The, what's the event? It's uh, the president's investiture. So I just on Friday there's gonna be a bunch of people in the atrium. So I, that was it. I just wanted to let y'all know. So sound good? All right, our last. Uh, topic devoted specifically to trust analysis is the method of sections, although we're not um, done with trusses just yet because lecture 11 and 12 are, I, I, I say, pretty much devoted to trusses, although lecture 11 is setting the stage for how we compute deflections in general, and I use trusses sort of as a, as a way of uh, explaining that, and then lecture, uh, so lecture 11 explains deflections, lecture 12 we did we do truss deflections. So the way that we compute truss deflections and beam deflections and frame deflections, is we use the same approach, um, but we just, you know, it's one of those walk before we run sort of things. So today what we're going to do is discuss the method of sections. It's the last um, method uh, in truss analysis that we, um, uh, that we have. So I, I, I do want to mention some, some advantages to the method of sections because I think I've, I don't want to say I've, I've, I've downplayed it, but, but there are some uh, advantages. So let's go back to our assumptions and where the method of joints uh, uh, shines. So, you know, basically our three assumptions have inherently baked into them the notion that um, the members contain only axial loads. So each member only has one unknown present, uh, one unknown force present inside it. So when we apply the method of joints, because with joints we are dealing with concurrent force systems, there are no moments uh, inside individual joints, we are limited to joints with two unknowns. So it's tedious, it's thorough, but it, again, it's tedious. It, we, have to do, we, we have to analyze more joints um, one by one, uh, and it just takes a while. The thing about the method of sections, I say we're going to explore this one later, we're exploring this one today, the thing about the method of sections is that we are able to solve for an additional unknown um, with a given section cut. The thing is, is that whenever we cut a section uh, through uh, a, a significant component of the truss, so let's say we, we have this truss here and we cut a section, section 1-1, one, one, and let's say we look to the left, we are now dealing with a non-concurrent force system. So with joints, when I say concurrent force system, what I mean is for any individual joint, all of the forces are all intersecting at a common point. But with a, a section cut, that's not the case. We've got 
Forces this way, forces this way, forces this way, force up here, force over here. The forces are all going throughout uh, through different points, uh, and, and so the, the advantage to that is that we can deal with more unknowns at a time. Because we're dealing with a non-concurrent force system, we now get to break out our third tool, which is the sum of moments. Okay. Um, whenever you're using the method of sections, you can analyze section cuts where there are at most three unknown forces. Okay, So that's sort of the advantage. The other advantage, I would say, to the method of sections is that if you have a really large truss and you want to find, let's say, the force inside, I don't know, this member, um, you might have to solve three, four, five joints before you get to that member, or you just cut a section in some moments and boom, you're there. So um, it, you can get results, certain results, a lot faster. I would argue that the method of sections is a surefire way of speeding up a truss analysis problem on the FE exam. Uh, it's very uh, uh, common on the FE exam to be given a truss and say, what's the force in this member? And if it's a large truss, it's going to take a while with the method of joints. Use the method of sections. It will get you there faster. Now, the other thing I will say um, with the method of sections is that there, is that there are two um, sort of strategy elements that you need to keep in your head. Uh, the first is which direction that you look. Um, it ultimately does not matter. I mean, the trust doesn't care if you look one direction versus looking another. You're going to get the same answer regardless. But it's usually advantageous to look one way versus another. In other words, if I cut a section here and look to the right, I have to deal with all of this stuff here on the trust. What if there's a load at every single joint on the trust? That's a lot of forces to account for when summing moments. Whereas if I cut a section and look to the left, there's just less going on here. There's less joints, there's less um, uh, 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 stuff to draw. So it's just easier to deal with. Yes, sir? In an engineering firm that actually does trust design, they don't do this by hand, do they? They have computer programs that... That's a, that's a really good question. So I would say you're going to find a little bit more variability than you think. Um, and, and what I mean by that is I think it depends on the context. Let me give you a couple examples. So if I was designing, let's say, transmission towers or, you know, those 3D space trusses that hold power lines, right. and then, I'm probably going to break out some software and do something like that. Those are really intricate, complex structures, and I'm just going to let the software do the work for me. Whereas... On the flip side, let's say I was doing some more routine truss design. Uh, a good example might be, uh, I'm sure everybody here has been to Walmart, right? Uh -huh. Okay, you look up and you have open web joists and you have truss elements used to support the roofs. Those trusses are very simple. They're, they're, the geometry is very straightforward. The uh, loading is going to be very straightforward. And in those instances, it might be easier to just do it by hand, just to get some member selections. You know, right. for a house, a trust on hey, my house. Like, hey, I was getting ready. I was getting ready to talk about residential design okay, just, okay. A, just a second ago, uh, but because I want I want to take a side note on that because it's a really good question. So I think it depends. If it's something that's more routine, I think you might find it done more by hand than it would be um, that if it was a little bit more specialized. Interesting. Now, um, let's talk about residential uh, construction. More often than not. I'm going to be honest, design doesn't really happen. And here's, let me give you a, a, an example of what I mean. How far apart do you space uh, wall studs? Two by fours. 16 inches. 16 inches. That's just standard, right? There's no design. There's no math. Now, we could, we could sit down and do the math and explain why we do that 16 inches on center. But in the end, if you're building a house, you're just going to tell the contractor 16 inches on center. Right. Same thing with roof trusses and so on and so forth. I mean, a lot of the... You know, for very standard houses, they're pre-manufactured. You're just using it. You know what I mean? Right. Um, now, when you start getting into more intricate structures, like like if I was building some you know house for some celebrity or some right, you know, right, millionaire or whatnot, well then, okay, those are probably going to be unique systems anyways. And then we'll start asking ourselves whether or not it's rigorous enough that I need to break out the software or I can do it by hand. So, but... I would argue that for most residential design, there really isn't much design. There's not much math anyways. You're, you're just, oh, here's the house. Here's the floor plan. Okay, here's how many wall studs you need. Here's how many uh, floor joists you need. And just go to work. So that's a really good question. So does that answer it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Anybody else? This is good stuff. So, 
I love, I love this stuff. Okay. All right. Oh, I didn't plug this out. Okay. So let's look at our um, uh, trust example. This is what we're going to work on today. Um, I, I picked a trust that I, I, I want to say was a little intricate. Um, it, so number one, um, the trust has oodles and oodles of uh, diagonals at varying slope ratios. Um, one of the things that you'll find is that I think this one, this one, and this one are all at different slope ratios. This and this are at different slope ratios. I indicated these slope ratios here just to make things a little easier. But to be clear, it's common on um, uh, drawings and whatnot that they may not be indicated at all. What I think you'll find most common on engineering plans is that maybe the slope ratios aren't explicitly defined, but all the dimensions are. So I know that from, let's say, H to M vertically is 15 feet, or from H to L is 25 feet, or you know, so on and so forth. So from that, you can interpret or glean what the slope ratios are going to be. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, uh, so we've got this dimension here, 6 at 30 um, is 180 feet, so that just means every space here is, uh, is 30 feet. Let me, um, let me pull the notebook here. Make it a little easier on this. Okay. And so ultimately what we're interested in is this member, this member, and this member. And I have, um, I'll tell you, I've kind of selected this trust for a very specific reason. Um, I have, um, the, the geometry is set up in a certain way that it can um, uh, afford us some, some thoughtful examination into our strategy, into what we should do. Um, but notice I have also given you the support reactions. Note that the support reactions are not equal. It's 45 kips over here and 55 kips over here. But then again, look at the, the loads. I mean, we have 20 kips over here on this side and 30 kips over here. So the reaction's going to be a little heavier on this end than it is on, on, on that end. Um, okay. So ultimately, we are going to determine the support react or the, the internal forces along these members. And so I think that it's pretty apparent that if I'm going to break out the samurai sword or the lightsaber, if I happen to be a sci-fi fan, that I'm going to make my cut like this. So we'll call this section 1-1. One, one. Okay. So that's going to be the, the, the place that we cut. And so that we're aware, the reason I'm cutting through those three members is because I'm, I'm asking for those three members, JK, CK, and CD. So those are the ones I'm, I'm going to cut through. And, and that does follow my um, principles regarding the method of sections that I can only cut through no more than three unknowns. Uh, another point that I do want to mention is that there is no rule that says I must cut vertically. I could cut like that could cut like this, um, just as long as you're cutting through no more than three unknowns. Okay, so you don't the cut doesn't have to be vertical. In fact, I believe on your homework it's not vertical. I think it's kind of you know at, at an angle. So. Okay, I know everybody's doing some drawing, so I will give you a sec. I would argue that if there's one downside to the method of sections. There's just a lot of drawing. It just kind of sucks. There's just a lot of sketching you got to do. Okay. Um, so let's develop our strategy. So the first thing we have to ask ourselves is which direction do we look? Now, honestly, I don't think analytically there's much difference. I have two applied loads and a reaction on this side, two applied loads and a reaction on this side. So if I'm being honest, the only... Um, reason for looking one side versus another is just how much we want to draw. And if I would just look at this trust, it seems like there's a little bit less to draw if we look to the left. So I'm going to cut a section, and I'm going to look to the left. Sound good? So let's do that. So I'm going to have to redraw some stuff, so bear with me. So, so we'll say section 1, 1. We'll say looking, looking left. Okay. So 
Bear with me. If you need me to scroll up or anything, let me know. I will. All right. So, all right. Let's get the drawings. So I've got. I'm gonna draw this over here. So that. 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 And I'm gonna go ahead and draw this. This. That's good. Okay. So we have. And again, uh, one thing, so one thing I, off, off on the side, we are going to have a celebration next week. One thing that helps, a straight edge. Bring a straight edge. It does help. Okay, so, here's this. Notice how I've drawn these joints over here on the side, but I haven't added anything to them yet. I will later. So, this is 45 kips. This is 20 kips. This is 20 kips. Okay, let's do some naming. So this is A. This is B. This is C. This is D. Okay. This is I. This is J. And this is K. <clears throat> the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do some uh, dimensioning right here. So this is... 30 feet. This is 30 feet. Um, 30, 30, 30, 30. Let's go ahead and add these dimensions here. So we'll say that's 10 feet. Oh, it's a lot of drawing, isn't it? There's no way around that. I think you just kind of need to do it. Now notice how I kind of haven't drawn anything right here, okay? So what's going on here is I've got my members going like this. And then the members kind of like, that's where they're cut. So what I kind of like to do is just draw sort of like dash lines sort of say that's where the members used to be. Okay? Right. All right. Now we're going to add some slope ratios. So this is 1 to 1. This is 1 to 6. And I'm sorry if that's tiny. I'm sure it is probably some of you in the back. So that's 1 to 6 and that's 1 to 1. And I've got three members. What I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that those members are in tension. So what I've got is J, K, Y, J, K, X, C, K, uh, Y, C, K, X, and C, D. Right, I'm going to give everybody a second to sort of catch up on that. Is everybody caught up or you need to set? 
I did a lot of drawing on that. I'm going to assume everybody's good. Okay. Now, before we start developing strategy, okay, I want to make a couple of points. So, note all members assumed intention. I went ahead and did that just to indicate that as we do our math, if we get a negative answer, that makes life a little easier. But I think the other note that I want to really drive in is recall the principle of transmissibility. And you're like, recall the principle of transmissibility. That means I'm supposed to remember what the principle of transmissibility is. What's the principle of transmissibility? Here's what the principle of transmissibility is. I'm playing tug of war with you. You have a rope. I have the end of the rope. You're yanking on it with 20 pounds. I'm yanking on it with 20 pounds. So the tension in the rope is 20 pounds. Now, how far apart are we from each other? What, 10, 12 feet, something like that? So what if I move back a few feet? He's pulling 20 pounds, and I'm pulling 20 pounds. Assuming no sag in the rope, and I'm sure, you know, sag corrections and geomatics, Dr. Nichols would get angry at me. But assuming that there's no uh, sag corrections uh, to take, take account uh, for the entire war, it's still the same 20 pounds, right? In fact, let's take this one step further. Let's say he was 600 feet away from me on the other side of 3rd Avenue, and I'm over here, and we're still playing tug of war. He's 20 pounds, I'm 20 pounds. It's still the same thing, right? We're still applying 20 pounds of tension in the rope, no matter how far we are, no matter how far apart we are from one another, right? Okay? What that means is that statically, along a common line of action, we can take that force and move it along that, that uh, inherent line of action and still get the same static equivalency. So, for example, if I have some, let's say, line of action, and I have a horizontal and vertical component, Okay, what I can do oh, I'll do better than that. I can take that horizontal and vertical component and I can slide it up and down that line of action and as long as it lies on that same line of action, I have static equivalency. So what that means is I can take these X and Y components and I can move them. I can move them up here down here, X and Y components, move them here, move them here, and statically we're still going to get the same effect. What I am getting at is I want you to consider those uh, ideas when we determine our strategy on summing moments. Okay, so let's talk about that. So I propose that, let me scroll down a little bit, I propose that there are three optimal <clears throat> locations about which to sum moments. So what do I mean by that? What do I mean by three optimal locations about which to sum moments? So let's let's look at the support reactions. Now the support reactions for this truss are 45 and 55. Now let's say I didn't give you those support reactions. How would you compute them? Well, you probably sum moments at A to determine the reaction at H, right? And then you'd sum verticals to get the reaction at A. But why did you sum moments at A? What was so special about summing moments at A? The, uh, this unknown goes right through it, right? 
So when we sum moments, we can disregard the reaction A, leaving only one unknown. With me so far? So I propose that when we sum moments here, that what we want to do is also eliminate unknowns. Okay? So let me ask you a question. Looking at this truss, give me a joint where if we sum moments about that joint, we will eliminate a bunch of unknowns. Tell me a joint. C. Okay, C is an optimal, is one optimal location. So, okay, because if we, um, if we sum moments at joint C, we will eliminate CD and CK. So this X and Y component can slide down here, and so these and this all go through C, they get eliminated, and all I'm doing is I'm solving for that component. So that's an option. That is one optimal location. Okay? How about another one? There's another optimal location. What other joint? Theoretically. I'm not saying we're going to do it, but I just want to identify all of them. J's one, but I, what's one where we've got another two members, unknown members going through them? K. Because joint K... Eliminates, eliminates um, CK and JK. The thing about um, joint J is joint J will eliminate this, but it will only eliminate the vertical component here, not the horizontal, and we still have this unknown here. So I only have one unknown going through joint, um, joint J. But I said three. Does anybody know where the third location is? So the third location is, I'm going to call point X. Where you cut it, right? No. Point X is right here where this diagonal and that member intersect. We're not doing that, but that is an option, right? Because if I summed moments at this point, I would only have to consider that member. Does everybody see that? I kind of want you to just see the problem as a whole, to see that that actually is an option, okay? And there are some instances where that actually might be the easier option, okay? So now let's see if we can figure out which one we're going to use. I get the feeling nobody wants to do this, so let's, let's not, okay? We'll just say sad face. It'll work, but it's hard. What about joint K? Okay, let's game this out. Let's, let's use our brains a little bit. So with joint K, if I were to sum moments at K, what would that give me? Like, let's follow through. What would I be solving for? CD. CD, right? So if I do that, what am I left with after I solve for CD? Two unknowns in the X direction, two unknowns in the Y direction. That's, uh, that's another matrix problem. So sad face. Technical, I know. You need to put that on engineering calculations. All right. Um, but what about joint C? So what if I sum moments at joint C? 
I'm going to be solving for JK, right? Once I solve for JK, what am I left with? This. Two unknowns in the vertical, one unknown in the horizontal. A lot more straightforward, right? Does that make sense? So, smiley face. That's the one that we're going to do. Technical, right? Just as technical as my statement about that fact. Okay, so let's some moments at C, all right? And so now let's just handle this like we would handle any moment problem. So we start at the left, work our way over. 45 times, what's the moment arm from C? We're summing moments here. 60 on this side. Okay. We've got 20 times 30 on the other end. All right. Now we need to handle that diagonal. Okay. How are we going to handle that diagonal? Okay. So here's that diagonal. I'm sorry, I don't want to reach, so I'm going to scroll a little bit. So here's this diagonal. Okay, so I'm summing moments here. So I can take this X and Y component and I can move it anywhere along that line of action. And I want to eliminate unknowns. So I propose that there's two options. I can move it all the way over here to point X, and then the X component would go through C. I get the feeling y'all don't want to do that. I can't, but I get the feeling y'all don't want to. Or we take this X and Y component and we move it at J. And if we move it at J, the Y component goes right through C, and all we're left with is JKX times a moment arm of, how far is that? Is it 30? 25. It's 25. This is, the, yeah, so this is 25. That's 30. That line's horrible. That, that's bad. That's, I think that's kind of my fault. We'll add... 0 0.12 to the mistake counter. So, there we go. I think that's a little bit. So, yeah, so 25 feet. So, what we'll say is, and this is over on this side, JKX times 25 feet. Okay, so we have JKX times 25 feet plus. 45 times 60, that's uh, 2,700, is 600 foot kips. So what's JK or JKX? Uh oh, you got to break out the Casio FX 115 S plus. There's some more scientific calculator because I hear the familiar slides of calculator covers. What's that? 84. Is it 84 or is it negative 84? So that's 84 kips this way. So what does that mean about member JK? We take compression. We assumed incorrect, incorrectly that. So now that we've got the uh, sum of moments uh, uh, yielded, or our JKX, what do we do about, so what do we do from here? I've got JKX, what do I do? Right, slope ratio. Slope ratio to get JKY. So slope ratio, let me move that just a little bit. So JKX is to 6 as JKY is to 1. So therefore, JKY is 1 6th 
of jkx, because, I mean, look at it, the, the y component should be smaller. And so what's um, 84 over 6? Is that 14? Yeah. That's negative 14 kips, or 14 kips in this case, down. I want to stop for a second, see if anybody has any questions. Okay, so now that we've handled uh, some of moments, now what are our remaining unknowns? We have CKY, CKX, and CD. So tell me what to do. I've got three equations of equilibrium, the sum of forces in the x direction, the sum of forces in the y direction, the sum of moments. I've used the sum of moments, so that only leaves two. Which one do I do first? Sum of forces in the y direction. So if I sum forces in the y direction, we'll do that down here. I'm going to try and squeeze some of this in because I don't want to, um, I don't want to scroll too much. Um, but I've got, let me see if I can make this a little bit better. I don't like scrolling back and forth because I don't want you all to lose track of what I'm doing. Okay. So what do we have? We've got 45 kips going up. We've got 20 kips going down. 20 kips going down. Now, based on our previous analysis, I know that JKY is 14 kips going down. So you can either put JKY is 14 kips over here, or you could be hyper-specific and say, I have it up on my free body diagram, and it's negative. So I could put a negative 14Y over here. Either one gives you the same answer. So I've got 45 kips going up. We've got 20, 20, and 14 going down. The only thing remaining is CKY, and I have CKY drawn upwards. All right. Did I miss anything? I don't think I did. So CKY plus 45 kips is 20, 20, and 14. That makes 54. Therefore, CKY is plus 9, or 9 kips, in this case, upwards, because we assumed upwards and we got a positive answer. So uh, what slope ratio is CK? 1 to 1. So if CKY is 9 kips, that, therefore the slope ratio tells us that CKX is 1, 1, CKY, and so that's 9 kips, and I believe we had that drawn that way. And so the only thing left to do is to sum forces in the x direction. Okay? And again, my sincere apologies, I don't like scrolling up and down too much. But if I look at my free body diagram, the only thing I have uh, that's horizontal is CD and then these two components. And I have CD drawn to the right, so CD goes over here, and then JKX, not J, H, JKX, is 84 kips this way, and then CKX is 9 kips this way. So 84 kips is CD plus 9 kips. CD is, uh, what is that? Is that 75? Yeah, 75. So I know CD is in tension. I know CK is in tension. I know JK is in compression. The only thing left to do is the Pythagorean theorem, right? So... 
to summarize. So CK, my handwriting is atrocious this morning. So this is 9 kips squared plus 9 kips squared. And so that is see, 9 times the square root of 2. What does that come out to be? 12.73. 12.73 second. Yep. Okay. And JK is... That is um, 84 kips plus 14. And uh, what is that? 85.16. Second. All right, so CD, 75 kips in tension. CK. 12.73 kips in tension, and then JK, 85.16 kips in compression. And to be clear, you could take these, uh, these forces and then continue on with the method of joints and solve the rest of the structure, or you cut another section, you know, whatever you want. This is just another tool in the toolkit to uh, solve for the forces inside the, uh, uh, the truss. So I'm going to stop for a sec and see if anybody has any questions about this. Okay. Any questions? All right. So um, I think that probably does it for basic trust analysis in this class. And what I mean by that is this is not the last time we're going to solve trusses in this class. But uh, I'll just tell you, we're going to have influence lines. We're going to start solving them here in the next couple days when we look at deflections. But I think at this point, we've sort of beaten trusses into the ground, right? I think we're all good with that at that point. So what we're going to be talking about next Friday, or on Friday, and then the following Monday, is the other side of structural analysis, and that's def looking at deformations. Nothing in this world is perfectly rigid. If you take a system and you apply load to it, it will deform. Okay? We need to understand how to compute those deformations for a number of reasons. Uh, first off is we have limits on deformations that we have to achieve in structural design. But we also need to understand the relationship between forces and deformations in order to analyze indeterminate structures. And that's how uh, software programs, uh, MassDan, Abacus, Risa, all those uh, programs uh, uh, analyze structures as they understand the, that relationship. And so the way that we're going to go about that is we're going to use what are called energy methods. Um, that is uh, probably sounds really fancy. It's not. You've used energy methods before. Uh, and so we're just going to repurpose them uh, for, for our needs. Uh, all I will say is you have a section homework due Friday, uh, which is, I think, pretty simple. Uh, the homework that I'm giving you on Friday due Wednesday, I'm going to give you some advice on some work you can do over the weekend because I don't want it to just sneak up on you. Um, but the next lecture will be a little different. It will be a lot more like movie time as opposed to us doing an interactive example. So just be ready for that. That's all I got, everybody. I will see you all on Friday. And I will pull up the code one more time for those of you that.